On April 10, 2019, scientists from an international collaboration released the first resolved images of a black hole. In particular, they produced a picture showing the bright glow emitted by the incredibly hot gas and dust orbiting around black hole M87 star, surrounding the dark shadow left by the event horizon, the surface from which not even light can escape the black hole's pull. The scientists produced this image using a monumental collection of radio telescopes collectively called the Event Horizon Telescope, and a technique called Very Long Baseline Interferometry. Very Long Baseline Interferometry, VLBI for short, is the process of combining measurements from a collection of radio telescopes spaced far apart to get super high resolution images. To better understand the new black hole picture, let's have a look at how very long baseline interferometry made it possible. The first thing to know about the EHT black hole picture is that it is a radio brightness image, displaying the strength of radio waves coming from each direction in the sky, just like a normal image shows the strength of light coming from each direction. The normal way astronomers take pictures of radio sources in space, like black holes, stars, or galaxies, is to build a large radio dish and scan it across the sky. As they scan, the radio receivers attached to the dish report the strength of the waves coming in from a small patch of the sky. The size of that patch determines how sharp the image is. The smaller the spot, the sharper the image. The patch gets smaller as the diameter of the dish increases, so bigger dishes give sharper pictures. These dishes are also known as radio telescopes, since they can take super zoomed in pictures of small sections of the sky, just like how a regular telescope can zoom in on things far away. Radio dishes are specially curved so that when radio waves hit the surface, they bounce off and converge on the receiver suspended above the dish. Notice how all these waves reflect off the dish and all hit the receiver. The dish is designed such that the length of the path traveled by the wave at each point along the dish is the same, so the peaks of the wave line up and the signal gets much stronger. This strengthening effect is called constructive interference. Notice, however, that if a wave came in from a slightly different angle, when the waves bounce and hit the receiver, the peaks don't quite line up anymore. The lengths of the paths are now slightly different, so the high points of some parts of the wave start to line up with the low points of the other parts, and the waves start to cancel out. Because of this canceling, called destructive interference, the dish only detects waves that come in from a certain direction. The curvature of a radio dish is specially designed to take advantage of this effect. The approximate angle between the two directions where constructive interference begins and ends is called the angular resolution of the disk, and it determines the smallest feature you can hope to see in an image made with that dish. Remember earlier how the radio telescope scanned across the sky, recording the strength of waves from a small patch at each point? The size of that patch is the angular resolution. The smaller angular resolution makes a smaller patch, giving a sharper image. For any given telescope, the angular resolution is the wavelength of the light it uses divided by the width of its reflective dish. Angular resolution is an angle, so the actual size of the smallest thing you can see depends on how far away it is. With an angular resolution of 3 times 10 to the minus 7 degrees, you could just barely see an astronaut on the moon, but on Pluto, which is much farther away, the smallest thing you could see would be the size of Mount Everest. The black hole M87 star is very big, but it is also very far away. So if you wanted to see it, you'd need very good angular resolution. If you wanted to just barely see the event horizon of M87 star, you would need an angular resolution of 2 times 10 to the minus 9 degrees, or in units used by astronomers, 7 micro arc seconds. That's really small, like seeing a bumblebee on the moon. Remember, angular resolution is wavelength divided by telescope diameter. So to get such a small resolution, you need a very short wavelength, or a large diameter, or both. The shortest radio wavelengths that can pass through the atmosphere to reach radio dishes on Earth are 1.3 millimeters and 0.87 millimeters, corresponding to frequencies of 230 gigahertz and 345 gigahertz. To get angular resolution good enough to see M87 star with those wavelengths, you'd need a telescope as big as the entire planet. 
Building a radio dish that big is currently way beyond humanity's construction capabilities. This is where very long baseline interferometry comes in. You can get the same results as you would from an enormous radio telescope by combining information from a collection of telescopes spread around a large area. Notice how with the original dish, constructive interference still occurs even when segments of the dish are missing. Less light is captured by the segmented system, but in general, the same angular resolution is still there. Interferometry makes use of this fact as well. We can't actually build a dish as big as the Earth, but we can use many smaller dishes to measure the radio waves at points across its surface and do the job of a much bigger dish with computers. Now, instead of scanning one single radio dish to build up an image, VLBI uses a different technique that looks at delays between signals at pairs of individual dishes. Imagine that two antennas separated by some distance record the same wave. Notice that they both saw the same signal with the same strength and wavelength, but the recordings are slightly shifted. The shift can be measured and used to find out something about the direction the signal came from. If the wave came from this direction, the signals are shifted by this much. If it came from this direction, they are shifted by this much. Notice that the same shift shows up at a number of different incoming directions spaced apart by a particular angle. Since it's equally likely that the wave came from any one of those possible directions, the strength of the wave is recorded in an image like this to represent those possibilities. Each pair of antennas generates a pattern of possible directions like this, at all different angles and spacings. As the delays in strengths of each pair of signals is calculated, these patterns are added onto each other and the final image emerges. Each antenna that is added is like filling in a missing piece of the incomplete radio dish. If you added telescopes all over an area to get a measurement of every single angle and spacing, you could perfectly recreate the image, just as if you rebuilt all the missing segments of the dish. If the telescope array was observing the black hole M87 star, the image might develop like this. In practice, very long baseline interferometry experiments only have a handful of radio dishes, so the final image is splotchy and blurry. But there are a variety of algorithms to clean up that image and get a nice result. So finally, the Event Horizon Telescope image. The now famous picture was built up in just this way, by adding the contributions to the final image from each pair of radio dishes. The actual image is of the black hole's accretion disk, the incredibly hot ring of gas and dust spiraling around the outside of the black hole. The disk is so hot that it is a very bright source of radio waves in the range that can be detected by the EHT antennas. The detected waves are processed by a powerful computer array to work out the signal delays and build up the image. Once all the signals are recorded and processed down, we get this stunning image of the inescapable surface of black hole M87 star.